did the tutorial sessions, you know, people were, they were asking questions, I guess, to a certain extent. All right, guys, I was hoping we could uh, finish off what's remaining of this. I mean, it's, it's tiring now, we should proceed, right? Sorry? Tired, tired of what? <laughs> well, you have to, you just have to, you're going to, you're stuck here until 2020, is it 2021? I don't know. You're going to be tired a lot more, especially. Great, so if there are no questions, then we proceed. Um, uh, so we, we, we started our, no announcements today. We started our discussion of, um, of how a computer, so the, the question, we started off with the question of, I mean, so, so what if we, we encode the data, right? How does the computer know, um, how does the computer know to say this is a Word document or this is a PDF document, this is a video file, or this is a sound file, right? Because um, remember that this thing we are calling a, a computer, at least when we use it, um, perceives the data in this format, right? In this format, right? So it doesn't matter if it's an if it's an image or or if it's sound or if it's video um, or if it's textual content, it will see this. Um, and so the, the question then is, how do we know whether this is a Word document or a PDF document? or a WAV file, for instance, or an MP3 file, um, right? Or sound, whether it's sound, image, or video, and whatever. Um, and, and we mentioned this whole notion of uh, file extensions, right? This is how we know. This is one of the ways we know what sort of application to use, because it turns out that a computer will, be, will only be able to process this data once you specify the application you're going to use to process the data. So if you want to view a PDF file, for you to view the PDF file, you must use an application software to open the PDF document. The PDF document has or is composed of data that has been encoded in a format that can only be read by an application that is able to open PDF files, right? Um, so this raises interesting, interesting questions like uh, the, the user is mostly responsible for this. And this happened with Luquesa and and Ms. Chipalo here, right? Where you, you instead decide to say, you, you create, you, you have your solutions in a Word document, and then you, you create a Word document which is, let's say, x dot, dot doc, right? And then because Moodle has a restriction, because this particular assessment or the assessments are the restriction, so you're only allowed to upload PDF documents. What you decide to do is you rename the file to x dot PDF. Right? What happens? Lighton assumes that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. Lighton assumes that, oh, because there's a PDF extension, I expect this to be a PDF. So what do I do? I use a PDF application to open this. But lo and behold, I can't open it because it's not a PDF document. Right? But because I anticipated this, I mean, I, I get to realize that, in fact, even, even though these people are using a .pdf extension, but the, the data itself is encoded using Microsoft Word. You understand this? So it's, it's important to, to make sure that you're doing the right thing, especially when you're sharing um, this data with other people, which is usually the case, right? It's, for the most part, um, once the data is processed, uh, it's shared with, it's shared with a, a number of other individuals out there, right? So you take an image and then you share it with the rest of the class, for instance. Right, um, an interesting thing about these file extensions, though, is that um, you can, explicitly tell your operating system what application to use by default when it sees um, any associated file extension. Uh, so you can tell your operating system, so whenever you see a file, any file with a dot .doc, dot .docx, and the user double clicks it, automatically run that file using Microsoft Word. Whenever you see a dot .html or dot .htm file, uh, and the user double clicks a file, use Chrome or Firefox to open that because this is an HTML document. You understand this? Whenever you see a .wav, .mp3 file, 
use your default, um, default media player. I don't know what people use in here. Do you understand this? Extensions, extremely important, right? Uh, and we'll see these extensions once we start our discussion of, um, once we start our discussion of uh, the MIPS instruction set. Uh, once we start using Qt Spim, you know, it's a Qt Spim, once you, 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 you click on file, open, it only restricts you to pic.a or .asm files, which is usually the case for these other applications as well. If you've bothered to open um, a file when you've already launched, let's say, Microsoft Word, you notice that you're restricted to specific extensions. When you click file, open, the list of files that come in that pop-up box, um, all right, either just dot, dot .doc or dot .docx. Uh, although you can tell your operating system, say, show all files or something, or all file extensions. You've done this before, yes? Yeah. Yeah, so, a, and the reason you, you do show all file extensions if there are characters like Luke Quesa, who decided to say, uh, it's a PDF, but it's a do, Word document, right? So for you to see that, that thing, you need to show all the files and then open that file, yeah? Interesting stuff. Um, Again, I mean, this was just meant to exemplify what we just spoke about. If you don't know what sort of, uh, or how the data was encoded and you just guess, um, like in this case, not that I guess, but I was trying to open a video file using a text editor, right? Can't see anything, it doesn't make sense. I can see something, but this doesn't make any sense, right? Okay. Right, so finally, right, uh, as we are wrapping up this thing, um, turns out that whenever we talk about encoding of data, this whole notion of data compression becomes really important, right? Um, um, we, we generally want to make sure that the data that we've encoded occupies the least amount of space possible without compromising the quality of the data, of course, in certain instances, right? Why do we want to do that? We had a discussion of computer storage, right? This is a finite resource. It costs money. So you want to make sure that you efficiently store data on these, on, this, on the computer storage devices. For instance, I have um, a phone that has 64, gigabytes of storage space, right? It's stupid for me to record sound using um, a sampling rate of 44,000 or 44 kilohertz. Why? Because the resulting size is going to be almost three times as large as when I encode this data or when I record myself using 16 kilohertz. So I'd have to make a choice, right? If, if, if this recording, today's recording is going to occupy almost a gig in, in, in space, it's going to occupy one gigabyte of storage on my, on my phone. What that means is that uh, by the time I'm done with this year, if I'm storing everything on this, on this phone, I'll run out of space, right? One gig for each lecture session. How many lecture sessions are we going to have in, for this class? In total, we're supposed to have 30 in this year. I mean, sorry, 30 this year, right? It's 30, 30 per term, right? But this is not the only course I teach, right? I teach other courses and I have uh, 15, 15, what, what 30, 30 sessions in these other courses. Some of the courses that I teach are like two hours long, right? So you realize why it's important to make sure that uh, you efficiently store this information, right? This is where, why compression is important. Not only that, just mention that uh, for the most part, once, once data is encoded or processed by the computer, it's not like you're going to store it on your machine, you share it with other people. When you're sharing information with other people, it's almost always the case these days, especially that you, you're going to transmit that data over a network. When you're transmitting data over a network, you start uh, looking at you know, that transmission in terms of bandwidth, right? How much is it going to cost you? Right, so you want to make sure that the stuff that you're transmitting over this network is as small as possible. So that you spend less money so that it takes significantly shorter period of time to transmit that data to the other parties concerned. Do you understand the rationale behind compression? Just good stuff here. 
Right, so I mean, compression is, I mean, if you're looking at the textbook definition here, it's nothing more than a process of reducing the size of the encoded data or processed data by, by using fewer bits than the original data, right? So uh, when, when you compress, when you compress uh, data, what you're doing essentially is you're reducing the total number of bits used to represent that data when compared to the original size. Right. And typically when you talk about compression, really there's two different types of compression. So there's what they call lossless compression and lossy compression. So lossless co compression does, it simply means um, you, when, you're comp when you compress the data, you don't lose any of the bits associated with the data. But with lossy compression, you end up losing some of the bits. And when you lose some of the bits, you are compromising the quality of the data that you've encoded. In certain instances, you can get away with lossy compression, right? Sound, for instance, images, video, right? You don't care if some of the bits are lost along the way as you're compressing this data. Why? Because you still be able to make sense out of what's happening. But when you decide to compress data formats like text, for instance, you want to make sure that you get back the original format. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't make sense if, I use, if you use the lossy compression technique to compress, uh, uh, let's say, uh, I guess the lecture, lecture, today's lecture, for instance, right? You end up losing some of the information. Yes? So, sir, in the lossless compression, yes. how do you dump down the size of bits and Oh, so there are, there are techniques that I use. I mean, a, a well-known, and I'm sure people have, that I've read have come across this, and it's at the end of the slides here. A well-known technique, it's not part of the, it's not going to be part of the course, but I thought it would be nice to look at it, maybe in the tutorial. Uh, you be, you'd be able to better understand what, um, or how this is achieved if we look at an example technique. So Nonde, and I probably will join you guys, uh, known that myself will showcase how this technique, this really classic technique, it's called the uh, Huffman coding technique, how it works. So essentially, you notice that um, the technique works in such a way that um, you, you, look for, you look for occurrences of maybe uh, characters or text that are the same, and then you represent them in such a way that the resulting number of bits are going to be fewer than the original. But the thing is, on the other side, once you transmit that, you have to uncompress it. Yeah? And so there are techniques that I use to do this. Maybe we'll look at an example in the tutorial so that people understand. Anyway. Um, anyway. Yes? Uh, Compression. Uh, what's with the benefit, like the real benefit of compression? When you talk of size, in most cases, the difference between the comp after compressing the same file and the original file, the, the difference in size is very, it's very easy. there's not much difference. The, the, the problem is the, the type of data that you work with, right? You've probably not encountered situations that I encounter almost on a regular basis. I'll give you an example of uh, um, a few, week, few months ago, actually, I was working on this project where I'm dealing with text, right? It's text processing, but I decided to showcase it as an, an example. This is a text file, a comma-separated file, right? Original size, 161 megabytes. It's just one file. I, was, I had uh, about what? Is it 16 million files, 16 million such files? Now, if one file occupies 161 megabytes, one text file occupies 161 megabytes, and you have 16 million of them, uh, and in fact, part of what I was doing was I was moving these things in <coughs> between different machines, right, over a network. So I can't, it, it would be counterproductive. I had, the, I had access to a network, right, so money was not really an issue. But the thing is the time. Observe, original, original file is this, compressed file is this. This is like uh, almost what? It's more than 50% reduction in the compression. Um, I tried to use another example here, and we're getting ahead of ourselves, which is fine. Uh, another example is I, I pulled uh, all the resources that we're using for this course, right? Uh, got the total size, I removed the videos, obviously, and the audio, because 
I was hoping I could share this with you people. So sharing gigabytes of data would be counterproductive as well, but maybe we can put them on the hub. But observe, the original size is, uh, the original size of the materials for ICT 1110 so far, the ones I was using as an example, is 419 megabytes. But when compressed, it's 363 megabytes. Now, in this case, I mean, the difference is not really that much because like it's just 13.4%, right? But still, this, this difference could mean spending less money. Understand? Yes. It would mean occupying less space on your machine. And you're not just looking at uh, this cost alone. What if uh, Edward shares these things with you as well, right? Maybe similar size, right? The other courses that you're taking. What if you want to archive this information on your machine so that you keep this information next year when you're in second year, when you're in third year, when you're in fourth year? You notice that you stand, you, you have a lot more advantages when you compress this data than when you store it in its original form. You're saving space. You're spending less time in transmitting this data, irrespective of whether it's over the network or to a flash, right? So moving, moving 363 megabytes uh, of data to a flash is going to take less time than moving, what? 419 megabytes of data, right? Obviously, I mean, these performance gains, obviously, you notice that the they make more sense when you're dealing with massive amounts of data, like this example is giving you right now, right? This is a lot of information, and, and working with, uh, with, with uh, data in their original format just wouldn't make sense. So there's a question? No? Yes, for a mostly kind of compression. Yes. Um, images and videos, are we using um, the same kind of compression pixels? You, you are, you are. In fact, so if you look at the original file that I showcased last time, right? I hope people are following here. If you look at the original file that I showcased, I said the original file that I, that I took, the one minute, 39 second long footage, I, we're using as an example. I said that that's shot in 4K. But the other, the other formats that, that are available via YouTube, because YouTube converts these things, when the conversion takes place, you're losing pixels in the process, and so you lose the quality. Which is why if you watch a, if you watch the same, if you watch this, for those of you that have bothered, if you watch this same video in, in 4K, I mean, in, if, you, if you watch a 4K variant of this video and compare it with one that's uh, using a 144p resolution, that's that the quality is poor. If you've lost some pixels, gone. So yes, you are. So it has everything to do with the number of pixels, not the size of pixels. So, but the number of pixels dictates the size. The, the size of the pixels is going to be the same. It's a one, unit. One, one pixel, the other one. No, no, no. There's no such thing. A pixel is just a uniform size. Yeah. Guys, are we following? Uh, these are important things to think about here as we're dealing with more. So, so you sit here and you think, you think like him, and you think, but what's the point, right? Uh, I'm trying to think of examples here closer to home. If you use, anyone use Google Photos in here? No, Google Photos, when you use your Android phone, your, 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 your images, the images that you take automatically may be backed up to Google Photos, right? You can get there at photos.google.com. It turns out, right, what, the, what Google Photos does is it will ask you to decide whether you want to store your images in their original format or if you want to store them in a slightly reduced, uh, with a slightly reduced quality. There's a catch there. They'll tell you to say, if you store them in their original format, you lose a number of uh, space allocated to you, free space. But if you agree to, to say, you know, you can do with um, lost quality in the, in, the, in the pictures, you store them for free. Do you, do you know this? Have you bothered to check this? Yeah. What do you do online? <laughs> Has anyone not noticed the Google thing I'm talking about here? Google, for Google Photos? Or, or has anybody bothered to, to, to check uh, 
if, if you log into your Google account to check, to check um, how your space is being used across the different Google applications, because it turns out that the usage of the space allocated to you by Google, for instance, takes into account how much space is used by Gmail, Google Photos, Google Drive, all these different applications, right? Yeah. They're integrated. So if you bother to look at, um, let me just show, see if you can showcase an example here. Um, what's the size of archive images? I don't know. Uh, oh, sorry. I think we should show this. I mean, we can't do everything in um, we can't do everything in the labs, right? I'll just go to my account. Just you might forget about this. I mean, maybe it will help explain certain things here. So if if I, I I'm I'm using my personal account here because the Unza the Unza account can be misleading. I don't store a lot of things, and also I have a lot more space, free space available because it's it's a it's an institution account. But if I if I look at uh, you notice this. The free space allocated to my Google account, my Gmail account, is 15 GB, right? And I've used up about 95%. So if, I, if I'm trying to reclaim space, I'd, I'd have to figure out exactly where this space, or how this space is being used, right? So that I decide what to get rid, what to archive, and whatnot. You notice that if I, if I check um, how this space is being used, it, large proportion is coming from my Gmail because I've had my Gmail account for a really long time. Um, but interestingly enough, you notice that there's a small amount coming from Google Photos. Now this doesn't make sense, right? Because, well for me at least, because every time I'm taking photos, if you see me taking those photos in class and whatnot, they are being synced to my, to my uh, Google Photos, uh, to, my, to my Google account, right? so I can access them via Google Photos. And I have a lot of these things, right? I take a lot of photos, and I can get away with that because I know that Google provides me with free space. But, but observe, if I, if, if I click that link that says, um, check how you can reduce uh, this, uh, the amount of space you're taking up, you notice at some point here, options, right? I'll go to Google Photos option, and then I will go to photo settings here, right? I don't know if people can see here. Hopefully you can see. This is what I'm talking about here, right? Garbage. This is what I'm talking about here. Um, if I if I store my that Google, so Google Photos is telling me to say if I decide to change the settings and say I want to store the photos I take everywhere in the original resolution, the full resolution, then it it means I'll I'll, I'll start using up this amount of space that is allocated to Google Photos. But on the other hand, if I decide to say it's fine, Google or Google Photos, reduce the quality of the images that I'm uploading to Google Photos, I, I don't mind. You know, it's fine, the quality is still going to be okay. Then I store them for free. And Google does this because they know that, I mean, space is, it's, it's, it's not free for them, right? I mean, it's, you know, they're spending money on these things. Right, so they, they want to make sure that they use up as, as little space as they can possibly use up. I don't know if this is making sense. Probably it is. Yes? Yes, you can, but, but, the, but the, the performance, you only notice the performance gains, although they won't really be that much when you have a lot of compressed files that you are compressing. In the archive, right? So if you have a zip file, one zip file, compressing it again doesn't make sense. In fact, you probably end up with a slightly larger file, I think, um, because because what you're doing when you when you zip your file is you're you're storing the 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 information that you're compressing. You're storing alongside that information, you're storing descriptive information about how that thing is going to be uncompressed on the other side. So that's additional information you're adding. If you're compressing it again, I mean, you end up with, you know, like more data right, that you're packaging. You can do it, but the performance gains won't really be that much. Um, I don't know if people are following what her question, her question is, uh, if, if uh, it would be worth 
these things are best done by looking at experiments, right? If, um, I don't know if I have a zip file here. So, if we look at this file here, the take home quiz for the one I downloaded from Moodle comes as a zip file by default when I download it. We'll look at, uh, we'll look at, uh, testing, that's it. What? From Moodle? Because the submissions from everybody in class. So, so if, if everybody in class submits an assignment, right, which is like, last time I counted, I, I guess it was almost 62 people. If, 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 I, if, I don't, if I don't download the submissions from students as a zip file, I would have to download your individual submissions, which is, which is stupid really, right? I would have to do that 62 times. Do you understand? In fact, not only 62 times, I would, I would end up using a lot more bandwidth. But if, if I download this payload as a zip file, uh, less bandwidth, one file with everything in there. So this, this, this 36 megabyte zip file here has all submissions for quiz 11. And then when I deflate it or when I uncompress it, I get to see the submissions from, from you guys. So that's the reason why, right? Uh, I don't know why we are doing this, but. So, so what I've decided to do here is, uh, decided to, you notice this, I mean, there's really no performance gain per se. So what I did was I, I, I compressed, uh, I compressed, I don't know if people can see, I compressed, I decided to, I decided to zip or to compress an already compressed file. Yeah, I, I compress, I have, I, have, I have this zip file which has submissions for quiz 12. Size is 35 megabytes. What I decided to do is do what uh, the madam asked. I zipped a zip file. I zipped it into this, this destination file, but I still have 35 megabytes. The performance gain is not there. Do you understand? Yes, great. <coughs> Uh, but the key takeaway thing here is uh, we, we must understand why it's important to compress. Why do we have to compress data, right? Why is it important that we compress data? Okay, I mean, most of these things I've already spoken about. And it turns out really compressing data involves the use of utility software tools. They're back, right? And there are a whole bunch of them out there. I mean, I don't know if WinZip is still available on Windows, but these days, um, these days, I think your average operating system will come bundled with, uh, with a utility application or utility software for zipping or for compressing and compressing, right? So if you right click a folder, for instance, there's an option which says send to zip file, right? You're compressing it. Uh, back in the day, there was no option. Right? We had to go online and look for illegal copies of WinZip and WinRAR, right? Um, yeah. No. No, that's it. No, 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 let's not uh, go there. No. No, no. No, they're not the same. It's, um, I mean, you could probably get away with an explanation of how, no, but no, they're not the same. They're totally different concepts. All right, I mean, I, I thought people might, might appreciate looking at the differences in the, the two different payloads here, just a calculation of um, how much space we are co conserving by zipping, right? Just 13.4% here. In this case, it's 70%, which is a lot, actually. In fact, in my case, right, if I was dealing with 16 million plus files and I save 70% in each of the 16 million files, you notice that I end up saving a lot of space, far more space. Uh, but it turns out that this notion of compression really is, you find it, you find it all over the place, right? So when you're converting, for those of you that have bothered to check, when you're converting a Word document, for instance, uh, to PDF, it will ask if you want to sort of like a, um, compress the file somehow, right? So that the, real, the resulting size is much smaller than it would 
B, if you decided not to compress it. I do this a lot for, for files, uh, for I guess for documents or slides that I know are going to be significantly larger in size, right? So I will, I will say, you know what, it's fine, you can, you, can, you can compress the images that are in this particular document because people will still be able to read the document. Um, I want the resulting size to be much smaller, right? So find it here. Uh, so like I said, um, I'll, I'll be around next week again just to, I don't know if we're going to do this next week, maybe other week, just so you can get an appreciation of how compression is, is accomplished. This is not really part of what we are doing, which is why I put a red here so that people know this won't be examined, right? But, but I think it's important that we maybe gain an appreciation of how this is accomplished. So I, I guess it would be a lot easier for you to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Don't know, right? Guys, uh, the, the thing with data encoding is done now. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. We've, uh, yes. Um, <coughs> yesterday there was a question that was asked in the lab. Okay, yes. I don't remember the question. Oh, yes, I have. You can continue. I just want a new session instead of one file. Yes, the question. What What is the question? The one that you asked on the yes, you have a color black. I don't know if people are following through with what Ms. Mlenga is saying here, but, but the, the, the question that came through, yes, the question that came up yesterday is, and I'm trying here, I hope we won't forget, please remind me if I forget about what we're talking about here, but we are, we are learning here, right? It's not, get out of the mindset of thinking that uh, we are doing this, you know, we come here Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so that we prepare for the exam. No, we are learning this. This is the goal. But it turns out because of the way the process works, we have to be assessed to try and check if we've actually learned, right? Don't get into the trap of the exam, the exam, the exam. So the reason I brought up that question, by the way, the RGB question is because no one will ask you, I said yesterday, no one will ask you what is D2 is back. D2 base 16 in base 2, right? I mean, sure, it came in the quiz, but in an ideal case, in fact, when you go out there in the real world, you'll be faced with uh, a situation that will require you to reuse some of the things we are learning right now, but you can only do that when you understand the concept. So the question was, given, given um, color black represented using RGB, or let's use red, right? Red is a lot better. Given the color red represented using RGB or true color with a color depth of 24, can you convert the binary representation of that color that we've just described into hexadecimal? Can you? Yes, we can, right? That was a question. So, uh, which part did you not understand? It's fine, we can take it offline uh, afterwards. Everybody understood, we can chat afterwards, yeah? is that fine? We can chat, everybody understood. Now, so we start, uh, yeah? On the last one, so I wanted to It shouldn't be the last one, we must ask questions. We're supposed to have the back and forth here, we should understand. Yes, ask. Oh, the last, okay. Yeah, um, can you say something about coding? About what? 
A codec is just a piece of software that is used to, you see when, when you, usually you talk about codecs when you use uh, codecs, codecs, when you're dealing with video. We mentioned that um, video is composed of what? Of um, uh, the actual motion picture, right? And sound. For you to be able to, to, to merge these two things together, you need to go through a process, right? You need to, to use some specialized piece of software, right? That is a codec. It will specify exactly what sort of format the container where the video is going to be stored, uh, how that thing is going to be encoded, and how that is going to be merged with the sound. So a codec really is best viewed as being a piece of software. Um, and typically when I guess we just typically when you uh, uh, best best of doing this, I guess, is showing people how this works. So if I was to open up the screencast, for instance, um, you know, it's being recorded right now. If I was to open up the screencast that we just recorded, and I decided to go to if you if you use VLC, if you go to tools and codec information. This gives you an idea of what we're talking about when you're dealing with codecs, right? Showing information associated with the codec that was used to encode this video format, right? Uh, this is weird though. There's supposed to be a stream for sound, but there's no sound because the way I record this is I just record the, the um, I just record the, the screencast, right? But once I merge, once I merge the audio and the video, you notice that there'll be a separate stream for the sound. So a codec is just a, it's an encoding scheme that's going to specify exactly how the video and the sound is going to be stored in your, in your video file. Yeah. Um, so now you won't, you won't know, you probably haven't come across this problem because these days most of these uh, software tools that you use to open the videos will have uh, codecs already bundled with them. But back in the day, you'd find yourself trying to play an M MPEG video file and the piece of software you're using will tell you to say there's a missing codec, you know, search for it or download it, for instance, for you to be able to watch the video. I don't know if that's still the case, but you can get away with um, application software like VLC because VLC comes bundled with uh, most of the codecs that you'd need to play the different types of video formats, right? Um, MKV, MP4, right? 3GP, all of those different uh, formats. Is that fine? Yes. Okay, so. Ah, when you're talking about race green, so the colors, there's something where you're already MP. Sorry. No, no, don't. I can't use the word. Just the key, then I get the key. Okay, well, good. Sorry? Going back to our example of if we said we're representing the color red using a color depth of 24. Uh, representing it in binary means we have a stream of what? Eight, eight ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight zeros. Another eight zeros, right? Hmm. There we go. <coughs> right, effectively this is just a 255, zero, zero, right? Most applications will not, will give the option of either presenting the color in this format never as binary or in hexadecimal. Typically hexadecimal is prefixed with, when it comes to colors, with a, with a hash or pound sign. And you come across this on the web, for instance, right? Or if you're using an application that has a color picker. We can convert this to hexadecimal by simply breaking this into what? Fours, right? From right to left. Four, four, four. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this is four or whatever. So this is a, uh, sorry? Okay, thanks. Do you understand what uh, we're doing? Okay, so, yes? I was just wondering, what do you mean as the, you talked about if you're trying to open a file, and then an application that wasn't designed to open that file, for example, if it was a video file. Yes. Opening there's a slide that you display. Yes. Those characters come. So now the question is if you somehow mess with those characters, are you affecting 
You would, yes. In fact, you'd probably end up corrupting the file. You'd end up corrupting the file. His question is, um, th there was a slide where we had, uh, we had opened a video file in a text editor, right? His question is, what would happen if you decided to edit that information? If you don't know what you're editing, you'd end up corrupting the video file. You should try it out. Open like a small video, no seriously, I, I'm being serious. Open a, a video file using a text editor and then just mess with the characters that you're going to see beneath their gibberish and then save it and then try and open it. Probably be corrupt or something. Don't know. But when you corrupt the file, it won't have, when the file is corrupted, it won't have an effect on your device when you try to... No, it has no effect on the device, but usually for a corrupt file, the piece of software that you're using to open the, the file will probably refuse to open it, just tell you it's a corrupt file, right? You've probably seen this, but if a file has been corrupted by a virus, for instance, that's what I mean by corrupting it. That's what the virus does, right? It messes the, the bits in the file. And then you won't be, sometimes you won't be able to read the Word document, for instance, right? Okay, is that, is that fine? We understand uh, data encoding now. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Which part don't we understand? So here's the thing, someone asks you how, 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 someone asks you how, if, how, how you get to read things on your phone, you should be able to explain now. How, you, how, it is, how it is that you're able to watch a video, you should be able to explain to people what's happening behind the scenes. This is what we've spent the last couple of weeks explaining, right? <laughs> Discussing as a group, yes. Yeah, so when it's skipping with an optical disk, it's uh, sure, the data is corrupt, but it's corrupt in a different sort of way. So uh, when you have scratches, remember we said the disk has, uh, has what? Trust and, pits and, pits and what? Pits and, what? Trust and peaks, right? So when you're writing to a CD, you're just uh, saying, if you're trying to write a one, a one then maybe it's going to, to be um, a pit, right? <coughs> Uh, or, or, or a trough, if it's a zero, then it's going to be a peak, right? You won't write anything. So that once your laser starts scanning through the optical disk, um, light is going to be reflected or not reflected, depending on whether or not uh, there's a pit or not, right? But if, so if a disk is scratched, the laser that you're using to read that optical device won't be able to figure out what's happening there, right? Which is why you have it skipping or something. Um, so, yeah, the data is corrupt, right? Because you've scratched the surface of the CD, of the optical device, of the medium that you're referring to. Are there any other interesting questions about uh, data encoding? Looks like this is a popular topic, right? Yes. I understand which sound. Which part did you not understand? Which calculation? It's just a formula, though. Can we say we include uh, the calculation as, uh, as, um, as uh, a tutorial question that we shall... Oh, there's a quiz on Friday on that. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> but it's I mean, no, seriously, I didn't know. That's where the questions are coming. I mean, no, I was, no, serious. They was thinking that people are asking because they're genuine interest. Oh, my God. I thought... Uh, There's never this much interest in this. Well, I was surprised. There's I'm never. Clearly, the calculations are clear about the quiz. The calculations. So we would start this, right? Sorry. Like they understood how images are being encoded, text, maybe the videos in the same context, but then sound or something hard. Right? So it's like. It's I, uh, wait a minute. People don't, still don't understand how sound is. Yeah, no, we do understand, but some people are still having some problems, and so it's us in general. So what I'm trying to say is. It's like you're almost done with something, but it's just a part of it. Have we bo bothered to do a bit of research on this to read up and understand? <laughs> Have we? No. The question was asked yesterday. Okay. That um, you 
check for you take a photo using an iPhone, then it sends to your phone. The quality is the same, but how come that the same phone that you've been using to take pics and transfer it to other phones, the quality now suddenly changes? So um, the, my, my first response would be, how do we know the quality has changed? Have you bothered to really analyze the different files to check if there's any differences in the encoded data? Or you're just assuming that the quality has changed? Number two, the, the response to that question would be it's application dependent. So it could be that behind the scenes application that you're using, and usually these are cloud-based applications, right? The application that you're using behind the scenes without you knowing, or maybe you don't know, but they've probably indicated somewhere that they, there's bound to be some loss in the quality, but you haven't bothered to find out, it would do that for you behind the scenes. Like I showed in Google Photos, right? Most people don't know that you lose the quality of the image that you're taking once you move it to Google Photos by default. So that's probably what's happening. And the reason is simple. Any application that involves sharing data with other people will have to make a compromise between the quality and the size. So it depends on the application. Sadly, I don't know how the, what application is that? Could you give an example? Okay. On, on the iPhone that you were using to take photos. Right. Then when we send them, the photos are of the same quality, but then suddenly um, when you take this step around and you get to share them, the quality is suddenly changed. How, are you, how, how would you be sharing them with other people? Um, There's an application in between. What application is that? We are sharing it through WhatsApp. Then What's up? Uh -huh. Yes, then a time you share, you share it, you use Zender. I'll, I'll pro I'm speculating here, but an interesting thing to do would be, we can do an experiment, maybe as part of the lab. Please, someone try this out. Take a photo, right? Because you know how these things work. You can, you can, you can, uh, you know the sort of utility tools you can use to analyze the images. Take a photo, take note of the size, um, <sighs> Take note of the resolution, right? Send it via WhatsApp, send it via share it. Get the result that goes on the other side. Check the size, check the resolution and see if there are any changes. If there are any changes, then you know that the, the thing that is manipulating the image or reducing the quality is the application you're using, WhatsApp. But you notice that there won't be a change in, 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 uh, in the quality if you transmit it using Bluetooth. Right, from device to device. Yes. Okay. So, so do you know why why share it works that way? Probably on WhatsApp there could be a change, but the thing with uh, I could be wrong here, but last time I looked into this, probably a different application. But the way share it works is different, right? It's like um, you're not. Um, do you need to be connected to the internet to share it? No. no. So it's, it's like you're using Bluetooth, but using like a fancy application, right? Do you understand this? But with WhatsApp, once you take a photo and you send it to somebody else, it's going to some server somewhere and then being transmitted to somebody else, right? So in the process, I mean, um, there's bound to be things that are being done to the, to the image. Hi, yes. Yes, sound and video are both data. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just, now, because there's a thing, um, God, uh, th there's a class I need to go to and someone is calling to find out. Oh, ah, it's fine, I don't have to pick up the call. Yes, the question is? Yes, so the question is, in a nutshell, what data is this? If, if we don't separate that sound, It's a way of representing information or data, right? Representing information or data. Yeah, it's a computer's way of representing information or data. It's encoding. Or so it's either data encoding. Go to Google and type in define encoding. You notice like it's the same as representation. Yes, define full colon encoding. It's a, so it's, a, it's just a way of representing information. Encoding works hand in hand with extensions, is it? Always. No. 
I can create a file without an extension. I can create a file without an extension. But how would the, uh, the CPU know the type of uh, application software that you're going to be assigned to open that file? The CPU doesn't care what application you're using. The CPU only cares about the instructions that are coming through to it. The CPU will know because the data, you're reading the data using a program, right? Remember this? Once you launch this program, it's loaded into RAM, and then in RAM, the CPU fetches an instruction at a time. So the CPU only knows what sort of instructions to associate with the data once you specify the application you specify it by going to start, say, Microsoft Word, right? And then using Microsoft Word, open this document, the data, access this data. At that point in time, the CPU knows to say, I, w I must start fetching instructions associated with this program and manipulate data in this way. The CPU doesn't know what application it is. It's the only concern with instructions. Fetch, decode, execute. Instructions, right? Yeah. Do you understand this? This is an important question, by the way, and uh, I'm glad people are asking this because this is why we are starting the next lecture series. This is why we're going to be discussing the data paths, right? This is like, uh, why are we doing this? This is why we're doing this. <laughs> yeah, they, they ask, right? Why are we learning about this? This is why. We're trying to understand how a computer works, right? Although in the process we've been abstracting things, and in fact we're not, there are even some things that I don't, I'm not bothered to look into. Um, like I abstract everything on top of, uh, um, I guess, the circuitry, right? So the, the quantum mechanics associated with how the, the, the transistors are laid out and how they work, I don't care about that, right? Just like mom and dad don't care how a computer works. They see this, it's just a box, right? If I press this, if I, if I type in these numbers and press call, it will call. They don't care what, what happens behind the scenes. But now we do, we care, we understand what's happening behind the scenes. <laughs> you understand? So this you must remember, the CPU doesn't know about the application. So now, the question, the question, the same question now is too, mm -hmm. how does computers know the data type? Because you give them the data the type. type. You specify. But you say that we should be getting rid of it without a fire station. Yes. You specify, how, how, how do you encode the data? You use a piece of application software. What, data doesn't just magically happen now, is it? You use software to create the data, right? Huh? Yeah, that, that, that software like right now, the data I'm creating right now, the sound, right? It's passing through my, my microphone, it's going to pass through the sound card and one more AC to D, 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 uh, unlock to digital converter and then finally to be encoded, right? No, but I'm specifying it implicitly. You see, th this thing knows to say, if I connect a microphone here, I'm not just connecting this microphone, by the way, right? It does, doesn't work that way. There's a piece of software that I'm using, right? Just, it doesn't happen this year. Well, I'll hook up the microphone there right now. Nothing will happen, right? I, I have to use software to tell the computer to say, I want to encode this data. Do you understand this? And it doesn't matter which type of data you're specifying. At some stage, you have to use software, right, to create that data. Yes? I think it's uh, when you're trying to get that in. Ah, this is, uh, I this need to software that you're using, does it somehow specify, like, we specify stuff for you to say, once you are done coding this data, it's going to be saved and all the work? Yes. You yes, and, and we are going to learn how to do this when? Next year. This is what programmers do, right? The people that wrote this piece of software. They wrote down code to say, when you connect a mic and you fill up this application, this is what should happen. If I press a button, like right now, very soon I'm going to press this button here to say stop recording. Okay, what did we say? This software has hey. like, uh, the type of data is yeah, but this is what we're saying, right? This is what we've been saying. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, each. Yes. That's exactly what we are doing. Uh, these are nice questions. Please, let's ask more questions uh, offline and um, 
Oh my god, I'm late. Whoa. Is this uh, very interesting stuff? Yes. Yay. <laughs> well, it's too late for it not to be interesting. The exam is coming. Yes. Can you help, help me switch off and. Yes, sorry? Yes. Sorry? That's when you are? When you try to interpret the data, that's your second name. Yes, yes. When you're sending it back, that's the code. When you're sending it back, you can see the code. Yeah, you can, yeah you, can, you can view it that way. Yes. <laughs> these, these are questions you should be asking. Uh, do we understand? No. Yeah, we do. We do. It's just that we have to pass through the notes a little more. But you don't, do you? We do, sir. We do. We do. Liars. We do. I have a question, sir. Yes. So, apart from the, uh, the extension is staying, right? Uh -huh. Can you give me two ways in which computers can know what type what of data it is that is encoded when. Because you get you mean, the example of the file extension, right? Yeah. Now, that's out of the way. So How does a computer know? Yeah. Why would you want a computer to know what type of data it is? Exactly. You use a piece of software. Uh, <laughs> Come back here. What? It's not. Like, <laughs> what? Wait, what do you mean, why would. How does the co computer know? Because if software. it's a bunch of. Software. It knows using a piece of software. You see, when I use Bukwes as an example there, I use the piece of software, a small little software, which is called file, right? As I say file and then file name. It shows me what application was used to encode that file. That's one. Two. Sorry? That's one. Uh huh. One way of. You're more likely to ask that give two ways in which than to say one. Two ways in which what? In which computers can know what kind of data type. You're more likely to say. But there's only one way. The user has to tell them. So, so, so if you say mention two ways, then you can. I don't think I would. I mean, maybe somebody else would. I don't think I would ask how many. Okay. Uh, two ways. That's it, you then. No, don't bore. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Guys, see you when you see me. Quiz on Friday, right? And don't be late. We know you, right? <laughs> don't be late. That's. Three ways, maybe not two. 